Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome. Um, I'm Master Sommelier Jesse Becker with Craft and Estate. Uh, we're an import division of Winebow and uh, happen to be the importer of four top estates in, uh, in Greece. Uh, but the real expert here is Ron Edwards. Ron has been uh, visiting um, Greece and has been studying Greek wines for, uh, for a very long time. Uh, and I would consider him one of the uh, experts uh, here in the US on, on Greek wine. So I'm gonna hand this presentation mainly over to him. Uh, Ron is our uh, director of uh, education and uh, um, also a fellow master sommelier. And uh, I think we're really fortunate to, um, to learn about Greek wine today from, from Ron Edwards. So Ron, take it away. Well, thank you, Jesse. I think that might be a little more generous than reality. I, I think enthusiast is probably a better word. I, I know that Madeline Trafon was joining the call and she's Greek and uh, she probably knows more than I do. And we've got a couple of people on that uh, I found out earlier are actually Greek. So this could be under pressure. We'll see what happens. Um, at the very minimum, I ad adore Greek wines. More than that, I adore Greece. Um, you know, I love visiting other countries and I often tell people, and I'll say this publicly, and I would even say it to my friends in, in, uh, in our Italian uh, imports division, that I really like Italy. I just love Greece. And it's more about the people and not that Italians aren't nice. They're very proud of being Italian. They're very proud of their culture and history. And what I liked about being in Greece is they're equally as proud as any other country could possibly be about being Greek. But the fascinating thing is they just, so much want you to be Greek too. That's the really cool part about it. It's like, yeah, we're Greek and you should be too. It's, it's, a, it's a really, really interesting uh, dynamic and a really comfortable place to be. So if you haven't been there and- uh, That's- Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say uh, that it's interesting you bring up uh, Italian wines right now because I was kind of thinking about this. And when you're studying wine, you know, um, you use sort of France uh, oftentimes as your, as your benchmark to study other countries and other regions. Uh, but like when it comes to Italy, uh, it, it's like it's a whole other world. There's a different paradigm there. And I think sort of the same thing uh, here in, in Greece. We've got um, a, a new language to learn and pronunciation um, and, uh, and so many uh, indigenous uh, grape varieties that make this uh, a fascinating uh, place to, to study and drink wines from. So um, I'm glad we're doing this today. So thanks, Ron. Oh, absolutely. Um, and not only a whole new language, but a, a different alphabet too. And that makes it such a challenge. And we'll go through and we'll, we'll try to pronounce these wines. And when they transliterated the words from the Greek alphabet to the anglicized alphabet or the Latin alphabet, I guess would be a better way to put it. There's variations, which also drives the student crazy is like, well, is this the right spelling or is that the right spelling? Well, they're both the right spelling. It just depends on whether you're talking to this person or that person. Right. But let's get into a little history because it, this is an, an amazingly deep country. When you walk through Greece, you're walking through 6,000, 5,000, depending on where you're standing, years of history. And it's everywhere. It's all around you. you can, it just like fills the air. It's fascinating if you have any affinity whatsoever to history to be walking around and you know, wander through Athens and know that you're walking through the Parthenon knowing that you know, this was biblical times and before this existed and Mars Hill and stand there and think about the history of the things that happened there. It's really fascinating. But sum it all up, all of the ancient history is hugely responsible for the Mediterranean basin all the way up to uh, the Black Sea and around all the way to Lisbon, for instance, of Greek influence, transporting grapevines, helping people figure out how to make wine. And then the Romans took it from them and then spread it even further. So our modern wine culture really is rooted in what the Greeks and the Phoenicians and the Romans started, but it started more or less with the Greeks because they actually established a culture where not just nobles drank wine and not just rulers, and it wasn't just used for sacrament and it wasn't just used for religious rite. It was used as a daily beverage, even by the common person. And that translates all the way up to us where we now as normal everyday people get to drink wine. And in this case, we'll talk about drinking Greek wine. Um, so thousands of years of, of history with this, but really, I mean, everything that's relevant to us right now is, is everything that's happened in the last, you know, what, four decades or so? Absolutely. And oh, by the way, I mean, just fun fact, they were the first country to actually create a fraud prevention program and an appellation system. And this was 
like first century uh, BCE, uh, a uh, common era range, they actually put a metal band over the top of the uh, amphora as they were shipping them out so that when it got where it was supposed to be, you could say, yes, this is still the same wine that left rather than somebody substituting it in between. So here's a picture of Yanis Caras and uh, Francois Mitterrand. Um, in interesting pair, we'll get to him in just a second, but the idea that um, ancient Greece became its most powerful and its most regal during the reign of Alexander the Great and they conquered the world and I say this sometimes sort of tongue-in-cheek but in reality they've almost been paying for it ever since. The Romans took over and they sort of adopted Greek culture but when, the, when that fell and the Ottomans came into uh, Greece, it was very much like when uh, the Berbers and the Moors came into France. They were Islamic by nature, alcohol was not approved of, so they heavily taxed wine, which kind of put it out of business. And it, the further north you were, the closer to the empire, the more likely you were that they just absolutely destroyed it. And by the time they got to the 19th century war for Greek independence, they really did destroy the vineyards of Northern Greece. So that's a different animal up there altogether as far as history. From that point to now is when Greek becomes uh, what it used to be, reinstituting itself as a national um, vineyard land. And really from the 1970s on with the advent of Butari and Santali modernizing winemaking and encouraging others to get into it, we see a rise. And then when they joined the EU, like so many other European Union countries, they had now some financing to renovate and modernize. And now our modern impression of Greece, as little as it may be or as much as it may be, is really based on the reality of the last 40 years. Uh, and it's moving really fast. It's sort of skyrocketing from languishing in antiquity to uh, really exciting, really well-made wines from all different kinds of things. So uh, this uh, Karas fellow must have been pretty important sitting there with the former uh, French uh, president. What's, uh, who, what's Domaine Karas all about? So Porto Karas was uh, the dream of a shipping magnet named Yanis Karas. And uh, he went into the, uh, what is now Cote de Meloton on the Halkidiki Peninsula, we'll see it on a map soon. And he basically custom created exactly what he wanted from the land to, to make vineyards. He bulldozed what he need needed to bulldoze, created uh, flatland, hillsides, whatever he needed for exposure, planted international varieties because in the 1960s, what was the most popular region in the world? France. And so he was basically on a mission to mimic France and prove that it could be done locally. He hired Emile Pinot to consult for him. And really, modern Greece took off from right there with that one man. There, you can still go visit the winery or stay at the hotel or both. It's a, it's a really cool resort right there on the water. Um, beautiful beach. I have enjoyed it myself. So very nice. Um, fast facts. 11 million people or so in Greece and a third of them live in Athens. So once you get outside of Athens, it's a fairly unpopulated country, if you think about it that way. There's more than 2,000 islands in the Greek um, boundaries, which are tops of volcanoes and all kinds of crazy stuff out in the, mainly in the Aegean Sea. And there's 9,321 miles of coastline. Interestingly, that ranks as number 13 in the world, Jesse. You know who's number one? Ooh. Canada. Well, <laughs> Thank you to the Arctic Circle, of course. That's not what I was expecting. <laughs> Me either when I looked it up. So uh, in general, you're talking about a Mediterranean climate until you get far enough away from the uh, Aegean Sea in the north and get into the mountains, and then it's truly con continental. Once they joined the EU, they, of course, started to follow the EU laws. They started with sort of um, a variation of the AOC system from France, including the same kind of terminology, which made it a lot easier for those of us outside of Greece to understand what was going on. And then, of course, they moved into what is now the PDO and the PGI system, which is now universal throughout the EU. I think most people on this call already know that, so we'll just kind of brush over here. It's Think of it as the 85% rule. One additional interesting piece to add to this for us is the traditional appellation that they added here. It came out of the Vendapai system. And it was there, uh, you know, the Italians did this a little bit with some things too, where they just said, hey, 
this particular appellation is going to go away if we don't protect it. And I think that that's the way they viewed Retsina in the long run, even though they love it, they drink it, they weren't sure what else to do with it in Appalachian law. And so it ended up here. So they just can't put a vintage on it. They can put the PGI appellation like Attica, or they can even go into a smaller appellation, an area. Example would be Marco Polo, uh, just outside of Athens. So I, I actually think Retsina, this is, this is uh, also, I think, part of the challenge that we've had to overcome with um, selling really premium Greek wines is that for a long, long time, and we're kind of past this now, but this was people's you know, first impression of Greek wine was uh, Retsina, and a, a lot of them were not so great. In yeah. fact, there's, a, there's some really, really excellent Retsina uh, produced, aren't there? There are, and um, you and I both have tried them um, and experienced them, and I, I'm a believer. <laughs> I really like Retsina. I think it's a delicious, and it is really applicable to the table, which is sort of the disconnect for a lot of people, but I think it has so much to do with where you source your resin. Um, this is an example of a gentleman harvesting resin from an Aleppo pine. That's an Aleppo pine. That's the specific pine that it has to come from. And there's a big difference between wineries trying to make really good Retsina are going to use fresh resin, freshly harvested, delivered quickly before it gets oxidative. Uh, old resin is used in less expensive and more ordinary and lackluster versions of Retsina. The location of the tree even matters. Um, I tasted some Retsina that was specifically made from trees by the coast, alongside of the exact same base wine made from Retsina in the mountains, and the wines were different. Um, the the wow. red itself had different characters. So there's more to this than just the aperitif and uh, drink 24 hours a day concept of, uh, of Retsina, but um, there is a, a mark of quality that exists out there. And I would encourage everyone on the call to go out and find a legitimately well-made Retsina like Yea or um, uh, Papianakos makes a really good one. Um, and if you're out in Europe, I don't think it's in the US right now, but if you're out in Europe, you can find Kekris, which is also really, really well made um, and, and get that experience. You know, but we already love aromatized wines, right, Jesse? Uh, well, uh, you mean like vermouth and... No, I was thinking more like Chardonnay with oak on it. Oh yeah. That aromatized? That's an aromatized wine, sure. I think so. We just happen to get, we're just used to that aromatization, right? And I, I love the way uh, Ron sells Retsina. Um, he always kind of brings up like, hey, we all love a, a gin and tonic, especially like on a hot day, uh, sitting on the, the deck. Uh, and that's really kind of the, pr the profile. It's very refreshing. A, a good Retsina is a, a delicious thing. Great with the, the cuisine there as well. Yeah, and if you, and literally, if you turn it into a spritzer, yeah. it is a gin and tonic. With, well, but a lower alcohol version, which is not such a bad thing, right? Right. right. Um, no, I love it. it. It's especially delicious with classic Greek food. I mean, you just go to a Greek cafe in, and have Retsina with it, and it's just, it's just perfect. It just makes so much sense. Uh, and oddly, last trip to Sidebar, and then I'll keep moving so we don't run out of time, but um, my last trip to Greece, I was actually touring a group of just normal everyday people, most of whom from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And the wine they drank the most of on the trip was a Pet Nat Retsina. They drank it on the bus every day and loved it. I was just like, oh, this is great. <laughs> very, very on trend group. Very yeah, cool. Very on trend. All right. <laughs> uh, this is really where we need your help, Ron, is um, uh, these great varieties and how to pronounce them. Yeah, there's like 77-ish important grapes in Greek. Uh, wine culture, but there's probably a, a hundred more than that if you start digging in the corners. But let's just worry with the ones that we're probably going to need when we sell wines here in the U.S. And uh, so let's talk with, about the whites. And so uh, let's, I'll pronounce them and everybody in the audience, you pronounce them at home alongside of me. This is the anglicized version that hopefully will make it easier for you to work with this uh, out in your market. So the first one is the one everybody's heard of, and that's Asirtiko. 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 The next two are blending partners. They don't stand on their own very often, but they are delicious on their own when you find them. Athiri. Athiri. Aidani. 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 The next one has uh, been renovated. That one was, the next one's been saved from extinction actually at Porto Caras, and it's uh, Malaguzia. 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 Muscat, we all know. 
Um, and then the next one is uh, from Peloponnese, and it's uh, Moscofilero. Moscofilero. And the the white, the next white is uh, Roditis. Roditis. And then uh, the next one is actually from Cephalonia, and it's uh, Robola. 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 Uh, then we have our famous uh, relegated to Retsina at, at one point in its life, but now made generously without being Retsina and really delicious, Savatiano. 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 And the last one is actually from Crete, and it's Vidiano. 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 All right, now let's work on these reds. The one that always tongue ties everybody. You kind of have to not look at it when you say it. Just listen. Ayoritico. 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 I struggle with that one. It's hard, man. It's St. George in English, but uh, ayoritico. Uh, Steve Olson once told me to go, I, your, uh -huh. Tico. I don't know. There you it's go. still not quite right. But it's a good start, though. At least uh, it eliminates it. Really, it messes you up if you try to look at the word and say it. The next one's a Crete-based uh, grape, Kotsifali. Kotsifali. Limnio, named after the island of Lemnos. Lemnio. Lemnio. Uh, Mandelaria. That one's now got a series on the Disney Channel. Mandelaria. Mandelaria. Uh, uh, the next one is, uh, I love this, Madeline Trafon told me, oh, you know, that's basically um, made into uh, communion and old woman wine. Uh, she told me that a long time ago, it made me crack up. Mafrodaphne. 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 Uh, this one has been resurrected on Santorini into importance. Mafrotragano. Mafrotragano. Just a little hint, whenever you see mafro, it means bitter. I mean black, excuse me. Black. Um, Nagoshka. 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 Sounds a little Russian, but it's not. That one's from Yumenisa, primarily. And the last one that is super popular and will definitely need to know how to say, Xinomavro. 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 The X sounds like a K-S-S. -S. Xinomavro. Xinomavro. All right, so on we are to diversity. And I think you saw this when you traveled through. Um, the one thing that you have to understand is it's sort of like the idea of Italy. You cannot put Italy in a box as a region, and you can't set, certainly can't do that with Greece. On the right-hand side of the picture, you have vineyards up in the mountains in northern Macedonia at 1,100 meters of altitude. And on the left, you have the barren moonscape of Santorini. And all of that is Greece, and everything in between, is there, there's an example of it. Um, by and large, you're talking about a Mediterranean climate, but as soon as you get elevation up towards Nausa, Mentio, towards the actual country of Macedonia, everything is now continental. So you, it's way too broad to, to deal with that. All right, so here's what it looks like. And so basically this breaks down into mainland Greece is northern Greece and central Greece. The Peloponnese, they, we carry that out on its own because of the isthmus. It's really kind of almost an island. And then you have the islands separated in between uh, the Ionian Islands to the west and the, and the Aegean Islands to the east, and then Crete sort of is its own thing. Um, so Jesse, um, I'll take a break here and let you uh, jump no. in on Catalonia real quick and talk about Robola and so forth, and then we'll, uh, we'll move Yeah, on. I mean, I think it's the one, the one um, wine I wanted to sort of mention out here in the Ionian Sea is from Cephalonia uh, because of the grape uh, Robola. Uh, Robola, am I saying it correctly? Um, it's it's, uh, it's uh, often confused and, and probably pretty easy to do, to think that, oh, it's got to have something to do with uh, Ribola Gialla. Right. Um, and this is actually, this, or there were even producers there that thought this as well. But uh, it turns out, I mean, if you look at Jancis Robinson wine grapes, um, there's really no connection at all. It's its own okay. a great variety. Um, and, but then, you know, when you taste the wines, um, there, there's also sort of a, it reminds me of Ribola Gialla in a way that it's very, it's not necessarily a, a super aromatic variety, but it seems to carry minerality and terroir, terroir really clearly. And it's um, uh, got a lot of lemony uh, sort of zestiness to it um, and a uh, uh, very sort of mineral wine. I think just sort of in the same way that um, uh, Ribola Gialla, but it's, it's kind of the one wine I want to mention uh, there in the Ionian Sea. 
All right. Yeah, and um, I've liked the examples I've had of it. Um, it's very one. It's just really interesting. So when we get out here, now we're just going to keep moving because uh, there's not a whole lot to talk about there for what we see in the U.S. market. And we're going to move to the Aegean, where the more popular islands, the things we've heard a little bit more of, re reside. We're going to touch on Crete in more specifics, but uh, Jesse, you want to just sort of hit on uh roads that it's an interesting area there's more there than just muscat um in the vdn style yeah um well i think it's actually more of a white wine island than it is uh red wine here okay. um and we actually we see some of these um varieties that um we might know from santorini like idani and Athiri uh, are grown here there's actually uh, some uh, pretty high quality uh, sparkling wine coming from Rhodes, so that's um that's an interesting one um, but uh, I, I, is, I don't know if this is next on your list, but uh, Crete is very important to speak about yeah. um, because uh, there's, uh, it's sort of the, the hotbed of activity right now. A lot, a lot of uh, great wine coming out of uh, Crete right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, was, I thought it was fun today. I was looking up grapes in Rhodes and the one that I had never seen, never noticed before was Mafrothirico. I was like, oh man, just tongue my tie my tongue in knots and, and bring up another grape. All right, so Crete, um, it really is this sort of massive uh, olive and vineyard area. Um, it's just a culture that's been there for so long. I mean, the Minoan civilization was there uh, before uh, Santorini blew up and probably ended it. Um, wine culture has been there for, well, recorded history and before even. Um, they have some really interesting native grapes uh, in, in that they primarily own and things like Cozzafali and Mandelaria are, are from Crete and they make very interesting wines out of them. And then there's another grape, Liatico, that actually they make both white and red out of, which I found fascinating. And these are the PDOs. You can see the, the other grapes there on the screen. Uh, interesting stuff like you're never going to see Thrapsathiri anywhere else other than Crete at this point. And Vilana is a, a specialty there that uh, in uh, Peza, they, the Peza PDO white is 100% Vilana. Arcanes is an example of what a lot of the reds are, which is Cozzifali and Mandelaria. And then of course, uh, uh, Daphnis. Uh, Daphnis is 100% um, Liatico in all styles. They literally make all style of wine, sweet, dried grape, Vidi and <laughs> white, red and rosé out of one grape. It's pretty fascinating. Uh, but Crete is a, definitely an exploration. It's on a huge upswing in quality, and uh, there's a lot of cool things to explore there. But we talk more about Santorini pretty much than anything else, and I think there's a lot of good reason for that. Um, this is an island that has amazing history and tr all based in tragedy, right? You know, so this island was its own fairly large island until... Um, the, the eruption that we're not exactly sure when it happened, but uh, certainly BCE, several thousand years. And uh, we're talking about an eruption on the scale of Krakatau, which was the largest recorded uh, volcanic eruption that we have uh, in our history books. This is an eruption that probably expelled um, by estimates 24 cubic miles of rock, 24 yeah. cubic miles. Um, four times the amount of Krakatoa. It probably created a mega tsunami that buried the coastland of Crete, and that's probably what ended the Minoan civilization there. Uh, it's also dominated by, um, which is the Kulura you see up here on your screen. The basket weave is there because of a couple of things, and one of them is the Atesian wind, which is a uh, it's this weird combination where a high pressure forms over the Balkans and a low pressure forms over Turkey and it creates a funneling effect of the wind through the Aegean and it can be disastrous and tear vines right out of the ground. So it's sort of like stark and moonscape in one side and then you turn around and you look at um, tourist paradise on the other side. It's a fascinating place. Yeah, the wind is uh, definitely it's something you always read about when you're studying Santorini and then uh, you visit there for the first time, step out of the car and man, it just hits you. So uh, very, uh, very much, I think, uh, influences the way the wine is, oh, wine is grown there. Great. So um, some terms to know, right? That basket weave, the, the, the formed basket is called a kulura, kulura. The technique of creating the basket is called Stefani. 
Uh, aspa is their word for the volcanic soil, which by the way, that volcanic ash is what you see on the surface. It's 200 feet deep before the bedrock. That's, that's what was left after the explosion. Nicteria, Nicteri is um, a designation for a ripeness level. It means that the grapes had to come in at at least 13.5 potential alcohol. In practice, they're usually uh, another percent higher than that. You're gonna see dry whites. The PDO for dries is at least 75% of Sirtico with Etheria and Idani blended in. Um, and then the sweet wines of the area, Vinsanto, which the original name, Vinsanto, came from here. These wines are absolutely amazing. Um, a style of antiquity. You definitely need to get a, a bottle of this and try it if you're on the audience and you haven't. The PDO does not have reds, but it may happen one day because Mafrotragano is definitely on the rise. And now let's deal with the Pelopanos, uh, Peloponnese, the peninsula just, there. Just to add one more thing to Santorini, we're always talking about like what's a classic wine, you know, and it's a, it's a wine that um, has a really, I think, clear and distinctive uh, identity. And I would say that of the grape variety uh, Sirtico, but also especially Santorini, I mean, it's, it's, there's no other uh, wine on the planet that tastes like that with that um, almost sort of potent um, intensity of uh, citrus fruit and then um, great acidity and a certain just saltiness um, that, uh, that makes those wines really distinctive. Yeah, the, the, the battering of the sea air and the mist that comes in at night, um, it is one of the most definitively oceanic wines I've ever tasted. Um, and I really think Santorini Assyrtico is well, it's my favorite white to drink at this point in my life. I say that without reservation, and I put it in my top ten worldwide possibilities um, for everything. And uh, you know, and and I have privilege; I get to taste a lot of different things. And uh, for people who are not initiated, I think Santorini is like taking great, like really great French Chablis and really great Austrian Riesling, and combining them with one more layer of something you've never had. Um, yeah, really fascinating stuff. So. Um, Interesting thing about Patras is it's really about Mafrodaphne traditionally, um, and they turn it into sort of a raisinated grape wine kind of concept. But they are now moving in their PGIs and, and, um, and just, you know, broader idea of red, dry red made out of Mafrodaphne. I had one example when I was there in a restaurant in, in Athens, and it was delicious. But really, Palaponese, as far as we're concerned here, is about Nemea and Montanilla. So, um, and uh, I see here on the Q&A that uh, Rihanna suggests just dropping the AG from the Ayurvedico uh, part of it. So I'll have to kind of keep that in mind when I'm trying to pronounce this. Just forget the AG is even there. Good tip. Thanks, Rihanna. Um, but this, this is a really important variety and, and for sure, um, I think the premier appellation for uh, Ayurvedico is Nemea, right? Absolutely. Um, and really the trick with Nemea even more so than soil type, is really about the belts, the bands of elevation. So there are three distinct sort of growing bands. The more fruit forward, the simpler wines, the, uh, the I hate to use the word bulk, but larger produ production comes out of the lowest elevation. It's where the richer soils are, a little more clay down there and a lot more uh, depth of soil. And that's that 750 to you know 1500 feet range. Then that middle belt, that 1500 to a little over 2100, that's where the sweet spot has been historically, where they get maximum richness, maximum development, not overheated, and um, the soils and everything balance out to create more complex uh, fruit profiles. Then up until now, uh, the the upper elevation 2100 to to almost 3,000, that was kind of reserved to make something that was a little tartar, maybe to blend into your higher alcohol or, or richer wines to balance things out. And it really wasn't um, as well suited to the wines that they thought they wanted to make. What, I'm, what we're finding now with global warming happening is that people are moving into higher altitude to keep the acidity in the wine that they really love. I mean, that's one thing that's really true about almost all Greek producers is they want tartness in their wines. And I'm trying to get a handle on this uh, variety, Ayurutico, and Ron, um, you know, is it is it more like, to me, they can be quite fleshy like Merlot, but they seem to have like a little more acid. Is there another variety you can sort of uh, equate to this uh, Ayurutico? I, 
I liked for a long time the idea of Merlot as well. And then I would taste some that were more like, I don't know, I felt like they were Italian. And I was speaking with Yanis from Yea, and he goes, you know, I really think they're more like Sangiovese and Sangiovese blends. And I was like, you know, I, why didn't I think of that earlier? And I think it's the color because they have a much deeper color profile than Sangiovese. So it didn't come into mind. I was thinking more like Barbera, but that makes a lot of sense that if somebody likes the style of Tuscan reds, they're going to like Nemea. They're going to like cool. Ayurvedico. Um, so the other uh, region of importance in Peloponnese is Mantania. Mantania is also all about elevation. It's sort of a consistent plateau in that 1900 to 2000 feet range. And uh, this is all about one main variety, Muscofilero. It's got to be 85% that. And you can put in Asprudes, which is another local variety that you can add to it. But Muscofilero is actually not one grape. It's a family of three grapes. It's kind of like Muscat. It has a white version, a gray version, and then actually, I mean, a pink version, and then on, right on into a black version. All three versions are allowed in any given bottle of Mosco Filaro. Uh, Montanilla is that lightly floral to noticeably floral. It's crisp, it's delightful. It's another wine that really reflects what Greeks like to drink, which is refreshing. Um, impre it, Flavor is a part of their lives. They like flavor, they're not afraid of it. And so a lot of the white wines see cold soap to make sure they get that little florality, that little extra bump, and maybe even a little bit of white wine tannin for the food. On we go to Northern Greece. Let's kind of get the lay of the land here. Um, when we come over here, I think you can see my cursor. We're in Thrace over here, and then we get into Macedonia over here. This is the Halkidiki Peninsula area. With Mount Athos. This is all monasteries. Uh, only men are allowed on this peninsula. And this is the slopes of Meloton over here where you had Chateau Caras and some fabulous beaches to enjoy yourself. Uh, here is the city of Kavala. This is uh, if you are uh, a history nut or you like to study uh, facts. This is where uh, the Apostle Paul first landed in Greece on his first missionary journey. And then Thessaloniki is right here one of the oldest port cities in the world. Eumenesa in the foothills, Nausa into the mountains, and then Amantio way into the mountains. And, you know, I think it'd be great if you like sort of touched on the idea that I was going to bring up anyway, this idea that this northern swath was dominated by the Ottomans and vineyards pretty much just disappeared. And so when they started to resurrect Greece as a winemaking region, these folks started from scratch, which is why Porto Carras started with international varietals. They're really not considered international varietals so much in Northern Greece. They're normal. This explains, I think, also my experience in, uh, in Drama, uh, which is Eastern Macedonia. And it just really strikes me, yeah, it's, there's international grape varieties there. But um, visiting there, it strikes me as a, a region that could be kind of a, maybe it's like Bulgari or, or even the Napa Valley, like one of these really pr could be potentially one of these really pr premier regions uh, for, for international varieties in Greece. Um, this is really a, a different uh, story in um, Nausa, uh, where you have Tsino Mabro, which is this um, just fantastic grape variety uh, that uh, has a lot of tannin um, and can be very complex aromatically. It reminds me a lot of, uh, of Piedmont, like Barolo or Barbaresco. Yeah, that, that most certainly does. And there are very different landscapes, too. This is a picture of Nausa, and you see that it looks like this. When you go over towards Drama, it's more... Uh, it looks more like Southern Rhone almost. It's, it's rolling hillsides and it's, uh, it's spare and it's Mediterranean. Uh, and what's interesting to me also is this is a very old country with a lot of their very old grape traditions and very old grapes. And, and when you wander around Greece, when you look on menus in restaurants, they have lots of these international varieties listed. For instance, the one we bring in from Paflidis, Thema, I could not find a restaurant in Greece that didn't have that wine on it, the white and the red, which are international yeah. bridal blends, uh, because that's good with them. They, they quote unquote, live in an old land. They'd like some new grapes once in a while. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All right, so um, Macedonia is really all about Xino Mavro, um, and then the other grape up here is Nagoshka. Um, and you need to associate this with little vineyard plots, small producers, very detail oriented when they're done right. And it feels like I'm walking through and experiencing Piedmont uh, in Italy in the same sort of thing. The wines are 
um, just as you described, red fruited and tannic, um, and they age and, really well. Oh yeah, they just become haunting, just sort of like a great old Nebbiolo, just such a, a bouquet of, of complexity. So, yeah, nobody's made that genetic connection yet, at least, or they haven't researched it yet, or they haven't proved it, or they, it's not really true. But man, they taste so much; they they act like cousins for sure. Um, it, it, on the Q&A here to pronounce the uh, Zeno Mavro, like almost like casino, like you're saying the word casino yeah. Mavro, it's um, a, which it's, that sounds about right, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty close. Casino Mavro. Casino Mavro. Um, and then Amenteo is much higher in elevation. So when you have that grape there, it starts to act a little bit more like tannic Pinot Noir and less like a traditional Nebbiolo we think of. Uh, maybe it would be comparable to, say, like Valtellina's version of Nebbiolo, more so than uh, Barolo Barbaresco. Beautiful wines up there, too, depending on the producer's style is, is variant. And then Eumenisa is a very important region to throw alongside of this, because here you get uh, Xinomavro blended with Nagoshka. It's, it's required 80-20. Um, and you can actually have more Nagoshka, but you can't have less than 20. And the wines here, uh, it, Nagoshka is a more fleshy, more fruit forward grape. And so it's sort of, uh, it's be like taking Barbera and blending it into Nebbiolo or the idea of Merlot for Cabernet. It adds flesh and, and texture to a fairly lean, uh, but exotic, um, you know, herbal kind of grape. And I love it. I think it's great. Um, there's several producers there that I happen to think highly of. Uh, you will also find up here, you know, Malagusia is planted all over here based on the success that uh, Porto Caras had as well as uh, Eurovasulu over in Eponomi, which is next to Thessaloniki. And here we are near the end of our journey in central Greece. Uh, we're back to Athens. We're getting ready to fly out. And yet there's another wine region to visit. Yes, indeed within sight of the uh, airport in a lot of ways. So this is really about the PGI of Attica and its sub uh, areas. Uh, we don't really have PDOs here yet. I think they will come though, because the wines are getting better and better all the time. Uh, what's really interesting here is the amount of calcareous vineyard soils here that we don't see a lot in other places in Greece. And I think it adds some really unique characters. You, you wandered through here. Um, what was your impression? Yeah, um, and uh, the, this really is all about uh, this great variety called Sabatiano, um, which uh, somebody asked the question if, um, if different areas uh, produce uh, Retsina from different grape varieties. The, the Retsina is really, this is sort of the, the heart of Retsina production is this um, uh, Attica region. And uh, Sabatiano is typically the variety, but you'll, you'll find it produced with other varieties elsewhere. Um, and um, so that being said, you know, then it's, uh, I suppose on its own, um, Sabatiano can be sort of on the neutral side, but hey, so is uh, Chardonnay without uh, doing a whole bunch of work on it. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the point you brought up about limestone, I think is a good one, um, because the soils here um, are this clay with, with just definitely you see this chalky limestone uh, on the surface. Um, and it, it, this grape variety, Sabatiano, it strikes me, uh, curious if you agree, but it's like, um, it's like Gamay in the way that uh, they always, the producers in, in Beaujolais always say, you get the quality from the old vine. This is where all the quality comes from. And uh, it strikes me as, yeah, Sabatiano, sort of a work, workhorse neutral variety, uh, great for Retsina production. But with these really old vines, uh, you get a lot of uh, intensity of flavor and complexity. And it seems like they can age for a very long time. So I don't know. Do you agree? It, it seems like uh, old vines is, yeah. is the key. I think that's certainly a huge issue. And I think the other is the intent of the winemaker, right? If you, if all you're going to do is make, you know, everyday drinking Retsina at X price, which is not very high, you're not motivated to cut your yields a little bit, see what the buying can really do. And as they've moved into like, let's find out what Savatiano can really do. I'm getting all kinds of texture out of these wines with lots of yeah. richness and depth of fruit. And I wouldn't call them neutral at all anymore. Um, you yeah. only have, to have one one sip of Papianakos's version of this to go. Well, that's not what I expected from Savatiano. Mm -hmm. uh, to answer the other question, you do see a fair amount of Retsina made from Roditis or blends of with Roditis, and I've even seen Retsina made with a Sirtico, uh, and it was just expensive and delicious Retsina. 
Ron, we sort of pushed it on time just a little bit today. It's, it's because we like talking about Greek wine. Uh, but um, quite a few of the questions here that, that I see um, have to do with food and wine pairing. So how do yeah. we eat these wines at the table? That's, that's the beauty of these wines. Like Italy, they're meant for the table and meant for food. But maybe you can um, share some general thoughts on, on well, um, what, I, what I to admit, do with these. Yeah, I admit to drinking Greek wine at my table on a regular basis, and regardless of what's being served for dinner because of that. It, they're remarkably amenable to food. Um, and I think some, maybe some of it's just because, you know, when you hang out with Greek people, they really love to eat and they really love to drink wine when they eat. And um, yeah. it's sort of a natural uh, combination. And their food is rich and textured and got a lot of flavor to it. And their wines are, are good at adapting to that. I, I mean, you can have some of their, like, Santorini, that wine will go with a steak, but it'll also yeah. go with grilled octopus. Um, yeah. and, uh, their reds are a little bit like Italian reds in that those are really food friendly too, right? And the, the magic for their reds is usually that tartness that you didn't expect out of them. And um, other than Sino Mavro, they're, they're not terribly tannic and mean. So they're a little easier to, to meld into things. And I've found quite a few of their reds like uh, mid-tier Ayuritico will still taste good with even fish because it's, it's fruity and tart without being too terribly tannic. Um, you don't have to have in any way, shape, or form Greek food with Greek wine. Um, actually, right, right. I, when I'm out trying to introduce Greek wine into the market, I don't, nothing against Greek restaurants, but they already know Greek wine exists. I go to everybody else and show them that you should have this wine on your menu because it goes great with Mediterranean food and it goes great with French food and it goes great with American food. Um, it's, it's pretty flexible. Totally agree. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I know that we have about, um, we're, we're coming, we've come to the end in general. Um, you know, if you're out in the marketplace, these are the wines that we represent. And if I was in Greece, I would say, if Haristo, uh, for thanks to everybody. If you're uh, on a time crunch and you need to scoot, please do. Otherwise, we're going to see if there are any other questions on the Q&A to answer. So, so, um, so, and we get this question quite a bit uh, via email, is the uh, recording available for sharing? And yes, um, all of these webinars that uh, Ron and I are, are doing uh, right now will all be on Wine, uh, Winebow's YouTube channel. Um, yep. So we, we'll get those, this posted uh, very soon to Winebow uh, on YouTube. Yeah, and um, there's, we're also going to, uh, not to spam you, but it, since you joined this and you're interested in Greek wine, we're going to send you an invite after this. I'm interviewing Yanis and Lido from Yea tomorrow at noon, and uh, we'd love for you to join that. It's just going to be a three-way conversation. It's not a PowerPoint. We're just going to talk about Nemea, and we're going to talk about Santorini in specific. And uh, then there's one question here that I thought was interesting. Greek spirit's important to know. Uh, Mastika, which is a uh, pine resin spirit uh, liqueur, and the other is Cipero, which is basically their version of Mark and, uh, or uh, Grappa, and they drink it regularly, and it's, uh, it's a very interesting thing. Um, do, you, do you find, uh, Dennis is asking, uh, it seems like it's hard to, to sell uh, Greek wine. Um, what, is, what do you think is the, um, the key to um, getting these uh, to the broader market, to getting people more comfortable and familiar with, uh, with the idea of drinking Greek wine outside of the Greek restaurant setting? Yeah, I think that the biggest barrier is us, meaning the professionals listening to this. Um, I was that person for a while, and then I just had, I just had to give in because the wines were too good to ignore. And so I, I use the example of, all right, let's start with things that are easy. A Sirtico, for instance, is so easy for the American public. There's two versions of it from Santorini, oaked and unoaked, so you can introduce it to people. If they like European Chardonnay, they're going to like the oaked version of a Sirtico. If they like um, bright, vibrant Sauvignon Blanc, they're probably going to like the unoaked version. But you have to have the confidence to put it in front of them and assure them, based on the flavor profile, they're going to like. The rest of it is... Um, getting comfortable with pronunciation. The, I mean, as Madeline always told me, you got to meet them where they are. You can't expect them to come even 25% to you, which means you got to help them pronounce it. And you've got to, you've got to assure them that 
you told me you like this style. You like red wines, like Merlot. You like. You told me you like Chianti. You told me you like Bordeaux. I have something new for you to try. It's this absolutely stunning estate bottling from Yea on Nemea, and it is all the things you like. It's bright berries and red fruits, and it's going to be great with your dinner. Um, and then they make a good decision from there, whether they're willing to take that small risk or not. And I think you can do the same thing at the retail shelf. If you're talking wholesale, well, we got to convince the person between us and the buyer that this is possible. We're down to the final minute. And I just love uh, Morgan's comment here uh, that Mashka Filaro, Filaro is amazing with anything with turmeric in it. That is really interesting. I'm going to uh, try that myself. Uh, yeah. immediately because <laughs> I got I to experience it. That's a really cool idea, curry or turmeric. I, I do. I agree that that sounds great. Ron, thank you so much for uh, sharing your uh, expertise today in Greek wine. Um, thanks for everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, we really have a lot of fun putting this uh, together and doing these. So um, our, our idea for right now is to keep going and uh, we just hope you join us in a future, uh, in future section. Yeah, next week is Earth Day and biodynamic, biodynamic and organic, right? How about that? Perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> right, thanks, awesome. Hey, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Ron. Thanks. thanks.